Hello, Nicole Shaka. Shaka, how are you? Great. How are you? Good. It's so nice to spend some time with you. I know I met you many years ago when I was your student at Hustle and Flow. Yeah, it's true. Years and ago. Many years ago, and we've stayed in touch through social media, but it's so great to connect with you and have you as part of my New Year, New You Summit. And when I thought about how to expand your mental health and how to have mental goals for the new year, I thought of you because you really bring that into your yoga practice with your students and with your social media. You're always giving such great tips and advice on how to be mentally healthy. And I know you've done a lot of work in this area, but before we go into this awesome interview, I want to tell my readers a little bit more about you because you have an incredible background. You're a celebrity yoga instructor. You are a professional dancer for 20 plus years. You are a kin stretch specialist, and we'll talk more about that later. And you are a professional host. You've been on TV shows like The Doctors and E! News, and you've been featured in magazines like Women's Health and LA Yoga Magazine. And you can find her on the hottest fitness app called A-A-P-T-I-V, App TV. Is that how, am I saying it right? It's Aptive. I know that's confusing. Oh, like active, yes. active. Yeah, on an yes. app. Aptive, you can find her on that app. So we're going to talk about, we could talk about your fitness practice, which is amazing, but let's talk about how you are handling your mental health, mental goals. First of all, how do you grow mentally? Do you read? Do you listen to podcasts? Do you go to seminars? Do you have a teacher, a guru, a therapist? Like, What kind of tools do you use to stay mentally fit? That's a great question. I do all of the above. I have um, a small obsession uh, with learning. <laughs> so I'm constantly trying to take in new information. I'm always on a new book. I'm always on a podcast that's either following an author, interviewing. Um, I love neuroscience. So any sort of neuroscience or biology or anything along those lines of meditation and healing and um, just that kind of quantum physics world. I just am mesmerized by it. So I am, um, I'm always looking for another seminar. I'm always looking for another book or podcast, or I have multiple mentors at one time. I really truly believe in that. Um, I've shadowed, uh, there's an author and a, I think he was a sports agent at one time. He's, he's made quite a name for himself. His name is David Meltzer. Mm -hmm. And I heard about him from a podcast about three years ago and I actually reached out to him to see if I could shadow him uh, last Thanksgiving. And my boyfriend and I drove down to, I wanna say, it wasn't Long Beach, it was somewhere south. And we got to spend the entire day with him and he has a film crew that follows him at all times where he's going around kind of spreading his message and constantly mentoring young people. And that could be, I mean, I shouldn't say young people, there were people there and they're, um, early 70s actually that were there just to shadow him that day because he has such a a mind for hustle and for change and for learning and business overall so my my ultimate thought on that is the one gift that we're all given no matter what state you're in is the fact that you can learn something new mm -hmm. and it's a godsend because no matter where you are on your journey, whether you're just starting something, you're obviously in the process of learning a new skill set or getting your feet wet. Or if you are trying to figure out what's next, it's going to take, it's going to take some kind of exploration in terms of learning. So I'm all about it. I think, and not to mention, it's it's always going to build your mental stamina, right? Like your mind is constant, it's in flux all the time. So anytime that you're taking in information, it's like doing bicep curls for the mind, for the brain. So our mind is like a muscle and we have these little thingies at the end of our nerves called dendrites. And if we don't use them, they shrivel up and they go away. And that's why people have early onset Alzheimer's and all these different uh, dimensions, stuff like that. But we can keep building them up. And I think people don't realize in this high tech area where we're so mesmerized by like the imagery and all the stuff mm -hmm. that we, it's not just about looking like we actually need to keep learning. So this guy, you, you followed him around all day with cameras and what was, what was your biggest takeaway? What did you learn from uh, shadowing him for the day? 
his main message is gratitude and service. Mm. So on top of the millions of dollars he's made and on top of the amount of just written books, um, gotten players, careers off the ground, everything you can imagine, he is about serving. So he wakes up every day and he moves from a place of gratitude and he figured, I mean, this is, this is ambitious. He finds, I think it was 10 people a day to serve. Wow. A day. And this man is like up at four, sleeps at minute. You know what I mean? Like I look at my life and I'm like, okay, if I can do one person. <laughs> right. But the goal in that is when you are in gratitude and when you are acting from a place of service, then you are not, you're not able to accept lack. I think being an outflow rather than inflow, like for my own mental health, when I'm thinking about me, 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 my, my, mine, you know, where's mine? Is it going to work out for me? I get into so much anxiety. Yeah. But when I just get over my own bad self and think about other people and how to serve and I focus out my, somehow my mind calms down. Yeah. I mean, that's, my, it's so interesting you bring this up. Just yesterday, my boyfriend had a call with like another one of his mentors and they were talking about the mind being a trap mm -hmm. and how certain parts of our personality, like no matter what happened in your life, you develop skill sets to, to get through life, whether it was a positive skill set or it was a survival school that literally got you through a household that was crazy, whatever, whatever it was. But the mind becomes a trap in the sense that when we don't recognize why we're doing something or our habits aren't clearly developed, they're there because they are a default for mm. something that no longer serves us. That's where we kind of get in trouble, right? So I know exactly what you're saying. When you're taking care of other people, the focus isn't on you. It's not on your lack. It's not on what's not working. It's on someone else, which gives the universe all this space to come in and fill that up with whatever you need to be worrying about. You know what I mean? So if the mind is like a muscle, and I know you, you've you studied neuroscience, there's pathways in the brain where there's certain patterns of thought. Let's say it's a negative pathway. Let's say it's how am I going to pay my bills at the end of the month, and that's constantly like a loop in your brain. So how do you retrain your brain like you're retraining a muscle? I know you're a fitness pro. So how do you apply those principles to retraining your mind? So that's a little bit more layered. Um, in my experience, there is a, a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. I don't know if you've heard of it. I'm sure you're probably familiar, but he breaks down how we become um, habitual in terms of the neural pathways in the mind, right? How there's a cue, there's a craving, there's a response, and then there's a reward. And these things are pretty much... Um, I don't want to say hardwired into us, but there are so many habits that we have, mm -hmm. whether it's thinking negatively and thinking, uh, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. This has happened. This has happened. And you start to ride that wave, right? Right. So making that up is, it's, it, it, I think it's going to depend on the person. For me, I can really only speak on what's worked in my experience is right. I have to get out. I have to move my body. I have to have an endorphin shift. I need to sweat. I need to meditate. I need to get out of the space that's reminding me of the stuff. Mm. So, and I know it's harder for some people than others. We're fortunate that we live in this place where we can have lovely weather all the time and just make right. those vibrant decisions to go outside for a walk. But whatever it takes, just to shift your perspective enough so that you're not rewiring those habits unconsciously, sitting in the same desk thinking the same thoughts, waking up to the same alarm, whatever it is, just making those small, like any, those small, small changes that you can make to, to pull you out of the, I don't want to say the rigid, the, you want to, what am I, what is this? Like a, like a, what is the word I'm thinking of? The loop? Like a, yeah. A, f a feedback loop, or I'm thinking yeah. of um, a riverbed. God. Right like a dried up riverbed that's, that's there in the mind. And it's just got no more, it's just got no more flow. It's just there. And you're used to walking it. You're used to walking and it doesn't serve you. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, I think meditation and yoga, they kind of give you space from these negative feedback loops and they kind of help you differentiate the observer, your soul, your higher self. There are many names versus your thoughts. So I'm wondering, what is your uh, meditation? I know you're a yoga teacher. Like, how do you distance yourself from your thoughts? Um, do you have a spiritual practice that you do that helps give you space in your mind? 
Um, yeah, I meditate and I pray a lot. Uh, the practice of yoga for me has shifted quite a bit. So the interesting thing is I found a lot of solace in the practice initially, but then I wound up with a bunch of injuries, which is now I study, which is why I study the biology and I study the physical practice of yoga because I see there's a little bit of a, a, a downward spiral for people's bodies. So initially it was the practice. I could get onto the mat. It became rhythmic. It became ritualistic. It became um, a moving meditation that allowed the chatter, the chitta as we call it, to just settle. Mm-hmm. And um, when that happened, I, I could hear my true self. I wasn't conflicted by all the externals coming into me, right? So even in meditation, on a regular, just an average day, right now our minds are in a beta wave state, right? Where we're taking in information, we're processing that, we're trying to delineate where that's going, how we're going to interpret it. But the minute you close your eyes down, you're moving into an alpha wave state, which allows, again, the seer, the part of you that is not distracted by the externals to step up. And we hear that much more clearly. That's why in meditation, I think we all feel so powerful. It's like a, it's like a soft, clear power because we're not being distracted by what's happening outside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because we, you know, we're in LA and so many people do yoga because it helps you get into great shape, but yet they, you know, will smoke a cigarette on the way out of their yoga class or they'll get on the phone and start screaming at someone or worse, you know, like speeding to yoga class because there's so much traffic and it's like, ah, I got to get to yoga class. So how do you take, how do you take that into your, your whole life and not just be spiritual and rhythmic on the mat, but take that whole way of thinking and being like into your regular life. So you're not like calm on the yoga mat and then stressed out all day long. Well, I think that's practice too, right? So I've been doing yoga for a really long time. I'm trying to do the math (laughs) since I was 26 and I'm 40. So it's been a long time. I think um, the repetition of that practice and being open and receptive to the seer in each and every one of us allowed, the more you do it, the easier it is to dial in right? Because it's like the neural pathways. The more I practice the breath, the more I'm attentive to my breathing. Um, I was also reading a book called The Oxygen Advantage by Patrick McEwen, which talks about how deficient our breath is. On the whole, we're stressed out. We're sleeping with our mouth open. We speak for a living. And we, we have the, this brilliant toolbox inside of us, the breath that we never even tap into because we're so busy staying in a fight or flight scenario that we don't even recognize that we have, again, these innate tools to keep us calm, to bring us back to the seer, to settle us into our own skin. And I think, I truly believe the more I study it, the more it's on the tip of my tongue. You know what I mean? The more readily I am to talk about it, the more readily I am to practice it in real life because it's what I focus on. So if somebody's getting stressed out and they feel like they're losing their thoughts, like their thoughts are starting to spiral, you can just stop and take a breath and go back into your breathing to kind of like recalibrate your mind so it doesn't start controlling you. Yeah, I would, I would recommend box breathing at that point. Box breathing is um, where you inhale for a count of four, you hold the breath a count of four, you exhale the breath a count of four, and then you hold the exhale. And I would repeat that like probably four times, especially if you're not new, if you're not uh, familiar with it, max four. But it's a very powerful breathing tool. I, I heard that the Navy SEALs use it under times of duress. So. so you inhale for four, hold for four, exhale for four. And how long do you do that? For like four five? rounds. Four rounds. So for most people, the holding of the breath is the, is the challenge, right? You can take a big breath in, you can take a big breath out. That's involuntary. We do it all day. It's the breath hold that will, for some of us, kind of signal a panic. Mm-hmm. But being able to allow carbon dioxide to rise in your tissues by holding the breath is a great tool for training the breath so that you are able to manage stress without moving yourself into this hyperventil. Um, hyperventilation or even uh, you know when um you know in fight or flight when you start to feel and I, I mean it's different for everyone everyone has different symptoms of this but for me when I'm really stressed my breath just lives right here like right. nothing in my belly I can feel it it's choking me 
Mm. The breath holds. The breath holds of the exhale on the inhale and the breath hold after that exhale is crazy. It's only four counts and it feels like an eternity. And I'm like, wow, that's when I know that I'm way out of whack. If I can't hold my breath for four seconds, we have a problem. (laughs) Yeah. So stress is the number one thing that I hear about through my clients and that takes away people's mental health. And I know that you have a child, you're a single mom, you have several different businesses, you're a very busy woman. You have, we have time to exercise with somebody who's working 60 to 80 hours a week and they don't have time to exercise and they feel like overwhelmed. How do you, how would you suggest they, ma- they manage their stress? You're not going to like this answer, but you have to exercise. You have to, right? You have to make time. Have to. It's either you, you don't make time now and then you can build all this wealth and then pay for your hospital bills or you make time now and then you keep yourself healthy for a longer period of time. And then it's, it, it's a cumulative thing. Our bodies were made to move. The reason we're under duress and the reason you are stressed from a 60 to 80 hour work week is because you have a 60 to 80 hour work week. So right. something has to shift there. You know, I mean, I, if that means that it's 10 minutes of stretching and that's your start, that's great. I mean, for sure. Everyone has 10 minutes. For Absolutely. Sure. And I, I tell people in my book to build their day or their schedule around their exercise because yeah. health, your health is the number one resource that you have. hundred percent. Yeah. So um, how did you get into yoga? I know you're, you're born and raised in Alabama and you've been dancing since you were a little girl. Mm-hmm. And how mm-hmm. did you get into yoga 14 years ago? Um, I moved out here to dance at 20 and then around 25, I had done a spin class that morning, a dance class in the middle of the afternoon. And then I had an 11 PM dance rehearsal for a free job at 11 PM. And I was doing this wild choreography and I fold, I I folded my spine forward and then ruptured four discs at once fell to the ground. And I talk about breathing. I did not breathe. I don't think probably for a month. I did not breathe because I was in so much pain. I had never felt anything like that. And um, so my father's a a head and neck surgeon. So I called him on the drive home as my body was seizing up. And he's like, you got to get an MRI. We got to know exactly what's happened here. I mean, at that point, obviously I didn't know that I ruptured my disc, but I knew something was desperately wrong. (laughs) Yeah. So I was on bed rest for a month. Um, I lost all feeling in my right leg. So I had neuropathy in my right foot for um, 13 years. The kin stretch, actually, the, the mobility training that I teach now brought feeling back into my foot after 13 years, which is cra- Nothing has done that. I've, I've lived, lived with it for this entire time. Um, I, dig- I digress. <laughs> so after the month on bed rest, one of my um, healers was like, you, you need yoga. And I don't care if it's Kundalini. I don't care if it's, I don't care what it is. You just need to get on a mat and settle yourself down. Cause it was my identity. My dance career was my identity. So being in that bed, I was just, it was a downward spiral. I had no idea who I was. I want, I was told I would never dance again. Mm. Um, so I started taking yoga and I hated it. I really thought I was like, this is the dumbest. I'm like, what are we just gonna do push-ups? I'm just going to do push-ups for an hour and then lay on the ground and take a nap. I was like, this is stupid. <laughs> but, what, but the through line was that I kept feeling good and I was not used to feeling good. I would leave a dance class and I'd have to have 40 ibuprofen, an ice bath, three ACE bandages wrapped around various body parts. I had never, I had never experienced movement where I felt nourished and good and supported. And that's where the entire, it changed my entire perspective of my body. Really. I was like, what am I doing to myself? I want to make a point to the listeners for those who haven't exercised or like, Oh, I hate exercise. They, we think as a society that it has to feel terrible or we're not accomplishing anything. And there's so many different kinds of gentle ways to exercise, like yoga, Pilates, bar, like just stretching, like you said, walking, just parking farther from your office and walking an extra 10 minutes. Like it doesn't have to be to the point where we're like breaking down our bodies to get the benefits of exercise. And I think that's a 
that's a paradigm shift that you had and that we're starting to have as a culture. Yes. Thank God. I mean, the work I do with functional range conditioning, which is specifically- Yeah, let's talk about kin stretch. So uh, I took your class. It was amazing. I've never like worked out my joints. I've worked out muscles and I've, you know, I, I played tennis growing up and I'm a workout junkie, but I've never had a class where I actually worked my joints and I felt so much better afterwards. So talk a little bit. You're a certified kin stretch specialist. What is kin stretch? Um, kin stretch is the name of the group format, which is derived from functional range conditioning. So functional range conditioning is where you see a specialist, they take a look at your body, they assess you, and then they determine what joints are sufficient and which are insufficient. And then you get homework prescribed at that point. Kin stretch is the group format. So it's the class format, right? You can come in never having seen a specialist and just get your body moving. So the idea is that you're creating body control usable ranges of motion, you're improving your flexibility, and you're understanding what's working in your body versus what isn't, right? So the, the beautiful thing about your joints is that they dictate movement before your muscles do. Mm -hmm. So if you have, let's say you have a, your shoulder, for example, let's say your shoulder operates in the space of like a shot glass. So you expect your entire humerus, your entire arm bone to rotate in, in the circumference of a shot glass, right? Mm -hmm. When in actuality, that joint, because it's so major, it's such a massive player, should be like a salad bowl mm -hmm. so that you can use all of that range of motion to just use your arm as it's meant to be used. But we have, we've become these special humans that like to sit and talk and be on a computer and make our lives efficient, oh, yeah. comfortable, this, <laughs> right? So we've closed off all this range of motion over time. And when, you're, when you do that, your body basically doesn't trust you with it anymore. So you lose it. So joints will start to, I like to use the word calcify. That's not what's happening, but it's like the space is closing because it hasn't been used. So when we get into a kin stretch class, I ask you to move as you did head to toe through its safest, greatest range of motion, each and every joint there. And you'll, you figure out, oh my gosh, like your shoulder, right? We talked about your shoulder. Yeah. One of your shoulders moved pretty great. And the other one was kind of like doing its own thing. And you were right, like, it was stuck. <laughs> Again, it becomes like a story about your body. You start to learn, oh yeah, I had an injury there. I didn't do my PT homework. Now it feels a little wonky and unstable, or maybe it's your knee. You've always had a knee thing. Mm -hmm. the, the biggest takeaway I find from this class is that people feel so much better because it's like WD-40 for your joints. Yeah, Just like the Tin Man on the Wizard of Oz. Exactly. It's, <laughs> it's just giving you freedom back. You're just allowed to be a better human being because the CARS routine that we did, the controlled articular rotations routine, yeah. makes you better at everything you want to do. Everything. If it's just picking up your grandkids. That's incredible. So Amazing. what are some of the podcasts or books that you're reading now that are just like rocking your world that you could recommend to our listeners? Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. What are your top three YouTube uh, shows or podcasts? Let's start with those that you are really learning from right now. Okay. So I love Tom Bilyeu, Impact Theory. I listen to that all the time. What is that about? Tom Bilyeu is the creator of Quest Nutrition. Oh. I believe he's a billionaire now. Um, yeah. And he created the podcast and it kind of spiraled off from the nutrition aspect into more like mental health and human optimization, which is where I found him. So the, the folks that he interviews are cream of the crop. I mean, just the best. David Goggins, Ray Dalio, um, Bedris Koulian. I, I, I could just name Joe Dispenza. I love Dr. Joe Dispenza. Yeah, he's great. Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself is a great book. Um, is that by Joe Dispenza? Uh huh. Yeah. I have it right here. You have done so much study in this area of mental fitness. I just, I'm, I'm in awe of you. Okay. Oh. Perfect. Yeah. Um, that book changed my life. I, that, this book was an absolute game changer for me. Yeah. Wow. So, so the Quest guy, who else are you listening to? Um, I listened to Aubrey Marcus. Now he's kind of a wild card. Do you know who this guy is? I think he's no. the creator of On It, which is a, I think it's in Texas. It's like a fitness academy. Again, another human optimization guy, but he'll, he'll experiment with like drugs and, um, and different things to have these kind of 
otherworldly experiences that doesn't interest me so much, but his perspective and the guests that he has on are fascinating. And he does ask pretty great questions. I do appreciate the way he kind of does his homework and goes in for them. So that one, I, I think it's called the Aubrey Marcus podcast. Okay. And what's the third one? Oh, gosh, the third one. Well, I do like to be entertained. <laughs> okay. So I, I love Dax Shepard, the armchair yep. expert. Okay. Now that is a sharp detour from the other two. But that's oh. part of mental health too, because sometimes we need to take a break and like mm -hmm. decompress our brain and not have to concentrate so much all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So he, <laughs> he has guests. I mean, they range from Ellen to like his mom. <laughs> to other you know actors and actresses what I love about him is that he's very quick-witted and he's very intelligent he had Sam Harris on which I was just that blew my mind that's a great interview between the two of them um yeah I just like to laugh sometimes and I just I not sometimes every day I think that's another huge component I don't think we laugh enough and I will watch ridiculous videos on YouTube. I will watch old <laughs> SNL skits. I follow comedians left and right all over the place. Like, I think we need more joy. And we just, the laughter is, a, it's a true medicine for folks. And we, we just need more of it. That's why I do my dumb stuff on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love your dumb stuff. I, I believe that joy is the evidence of God. And we're meant to be joyous. We're not meant to like, work for 40 years and then retire at 65, like totally injured and not able to enjoy our life. Like we're mm. meant to have fun right here, right now. And it's like, yeah. how, how do you find joy in your day? I know that you have a great boyfriend an adorable six-year-old, you have great clients. Like what do you do on a daily basis to cultivate joy? Um, I'm fortunate to, I have to say that I'm, um, I'm, constantly in pursuit of it. You know what I mean? So whether that's interaction with my child, I mean, I'm so thankful. He is a wonderful soul with a wonderful attitude. I mean, I could have been blessed with a real downer, but that's not who he is. Um, my boyfriend's incredible. He is constantly doing work on himself. So he's, in, he's um, introduced me to, you know, other experts and mentors. So I'm, I'm, I've surrounded myself with people that are, again, going back to square one, eager to learn. Mm -hmm. My mind stays consistently fed through comedy or neuroscience or the childlike view of a Lego set, whatever it is, I found a way to, to maintain that. I also, um, probably two years ago, I wrote a note to myself that's in my car and it says, take a deep breath, find gratitude here and then sit with it. And then I love you. And it's on my rear view mirror. So whenever I like look up, I, I read it really quickly. And I, I don't know, maybe that's like a subliminal thing. And now it's just seeped into me. And I think about that all the time, but it helps. I'm all about sticky notes all over house. I mean, I would, I would stick this whole house with notes if I didn't have other people living here to judge me. Affirmations are so powerful. Yes. So what's they, one of your favorite affirmations other than the one that you just talked about in your car? Um, I don't know if this is an affirmation right now. This is the way I'm praying right now. I'm going to just, that's okay. the first thing that's coming to yeah, my mind. Yeah. I'm manifesting, um, opportunities like this with people that are well-intentioned of the highest order in their craft that see my value and that elevate me to serve better. And look, here we are, we're doing it. Exactly. It's true. You, you just got to, Wherever you can see it, if it needs to be in writing, like for me, that's really helpful. Some people can memorize it and say it to themselves all day. I need to see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's just my. I have a couple of favorites. One is all things are working together for my highest good. And the other one is things are working out better than I could have imagined. Ooh, I like that one. Right? That might have to go on my bathroom mirror. <laughs> So how do people set mental goals for 2020? This is the new year, new you summit. So we are helping people get optimization in the seven areas of life I talk about in my book. We're talking about mental with you. What is a way to quantify or set mental goals for 2020 in your opinion? Excuse me. Well, I have um, a couple thoughts on that. I like to set attainable goals. 
-hmm. right? Because sometimes they're super lofty, we get overwhelmed, we don't hit square one, and then we give up and we're back, you know, back to the ditch. So if it's something simple, like an example might be meatless Monday, which my neighbor started and I was like, hey, that is a great goal. I don't need to consume as much meat. I love plant-based food. I think it's important that my child sees me doing that. So that's easy, right? You can preset your meals for Monday and it includes no meat, goal set, mm -hmm. goal met rather. Um, if you need to be drinking more water, maybe you, I have them positioned all over my house, right? So I have a water bottle in my car, I have a water bottle in my living room, I have a water bottle by my bed. Like everywhere I go, I'm positioning myself to win. And there's right. small little things, right? It's not me you know, starting a new business. Not that that's not great, but I'm trying to do these little things that are making me feel good about my, my decision making. Um, and then I would say like, you gotta, you gotta celebrate um, the wins. Mm -hmm. Even if they're small. I, um, I think I'm pretty good at that. I'm obnoxious actually about that. My child, my child this is great. My child and my boyfriend were throwing the football and Bo was catching it really well, right? And I'm like, babe, I'm like, you're killing it right now. And he looked at me, he's like, enough with the positivity woman. And I said, oh no, there's never enough. It's still coming. But my point is the celebration of those small wins is reinforcing the pattern. It's reinforcing the habit. It's reinforcing the good. You know, and we, we need to do that instead of we just- We don't do that enough. We have all these like harsh, like- goals and things that we're working and striving toward to attain. But when we do something like if we drink, you know, the right amount of water in a day, or if we go three Mondays without meat, it yeah. is a celebration. Yeah. There's, I had, I saw a meme. I, I posted it on Instagram. It said something like take a bow and congratulate yourself for all the work that you've done that no one knows about. Right. And I was like, huh, that's a good one. And because that, that we, reminds me of that quote, that character is built when you do good things when nobody's watching. Oh, yeah. It's so true. Yeah. And you, you, that's something to celebrate. You know, we think it has to be some like pat on the back or some new car or whatever. Like at the end of the day, you can't celebrate your small wins. It's, it's, not, it's not looking that good. You got to just take them when you can. Exactly. And there's small wins to celebrate every day, which circles back to the practice of gratitude. Like I, I really believe in writing a gratitude list at least once a day, every morning, every night, just five simple things. And it's amazing how that rewires your brain to think yeah. of even more things to be grateful for. Yeah. And it, yeah, just to try and be creative and not pick the same thing you picked yesterday or right. Like not to go to the obvious, like my family. Right. Right. Well, you just, you stepping out of the, I think that's a great idea. I did, um, I had a practice for a while. I don't know why I stopped doing that. I, no, I guess I'd still do it. I don't do it as consistently. That's the problem. But before I step foot out of bed, I'm like, thank you God for this day. And then I think of three things that I'm grateful for that may or may not have happened. So that way I'm putting into the universe, like I'm just wide open. I'm wide open for whatever could happen. And then also the things that are working that I know about. That's really cool. So how do people keep in touch with you? Oh, well, through either Instagram or Facebook, or you can sign up for my email list. I send out probably maybe once a month emails right. and I will never bombard you because why would I do that? <laughs> I don't hate, I can't. People that do that, I'm like, stop it. Yeah. Um, so the email sign up is on my website, nicoleshakayoga.com. You can also sign up via Instagram through my little link tree in my bio. Um, and how do you spell your name? Oh, yeah. It's a good one, huh? Yeah, right? <laughs> Let's spell uh, it out for our listeners. I'll have it written down, but just in case someone's like listening where they can't write, what, what is it? It's Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E. Last name is Shaka, S-C-I-A-C-C-A. -C -C -A. Okay. So, Nicole, your website is what? Nicole Shaka Yoga. Dot com. Perfect. All and then yeah. you said you might have a little something, something, a little gift or bonus for my listeners. Tell us about yeah. that. Okay. So my, um, the app that we had a, tr we had trouble saying earlier, <laughs> Aptive, um, is an all inclusive, it's the number one audio fitness app. And what that means is you can pop in earbuds, go to your gym, go on a walk and have a 
incredible world-renowned trainer in your ear, guiding you step-by-step, step, whether that is a high-intensity workout, whether it's training for a marathon. I do a ton of meditations on there. In fact, any minute now, actually, depending on when you're watching this, January 3rd, my Embrace Change program launches, and it is a meditation and yoga program to embrace change. So I have a code. Ooh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> watching this could use it. It's Nicole 30, and it will save you 30% on a yearly subscription. So I think instead of like 100 and something, it brings us down to about 70, but it's limitless. So you could work out all day long, You and there's new classes dropping every single day. So whether it's meditation or stretching or training for a marathon or cycling classes, they're all on there. And you have your own program on there called Embrace Change. So is, what is that program about? So that program is basically training the mind for change. It's about habits. It's about um, ownership of your life. It's, it is a, I think it's 21. Yes, it's 21 days. And um, again, it's meditation and yoga. So the two things kind of piggyback off of one another. You could never have done a yoga class before and you'd be fine. Um, if you have an advanced practice, you would be fine as well because there's options for all levels. Um, and it's really exciting. I love that you're actually sharing your mental health habits with the world through this app, Embrace Change. And I love that it's 21 days because it takes 21 days to form a habit and 90 days to form a lifestyle, the 2190 rule. So that. Nicole, thank you so much for sharing time with us and giving some of your great tips, tools, and strategies for mental health and how to expand your mind in the new year. And we will definitely be looking for your app on Active Embrace Change. Yep. And we will see you soon, everyone. We are so excited to have another expert tomorrow. Mwah! Bye, listeners. Bye, Nicole. Thanks Bye. for tuning in, everyone.